This is a production of PBS Charlotte. In 1900, Cotton's king in Charlotte, bales stacked up at the rail yards and textile mills fueled the city's growth. And prosperity draws merchants eager to hang their shingle, and new stores fill the downtown. Among the merchants, the son of a Methodist minister, Joseph Benjamin Ivey. My great-grandfather, J.B. Ivey, started the company in 1900. It started as a small dry goods store and grew into a chain of department stores selling high-end clothing and housewares known as Ivy's. It was the place to shop. Everything was first class. If you told somebody you got something from Ivy's, that meant something. Family run for eight decades, the department store chain brought the glitz and glamour of New York and Paris to the Carolinas and Florida. This is the story of Ivy's. The following episode of Trail of History is brought to you by Central Piedmont Community College and viewers like you. Thank you. Bragg Financial Advisors, a family-owned wealth management firm providing investment management and tax and estate planning for families, individuals, and institutions for more than 50 years, committed to our clients, to education, and our community. Hello, I'm Tony Zeiss, president of Central Piedmont Community College. You know, the rich and diverse history of the Charlotte region is just wonderful, and we at the college want to bring it to you and share it. We understand the importance of history. We understand the importance of learning from the past so that we can do better in the future. I want to tell you that you're in for a real treat. The History Department at Central Piedmont Community College has partnered with our television station to bring you this special one-of-a-kind history program. Stay tuned. I'm sure you're going to enjoy it. Hello, I'm Gary Ritter, and welcome to A Trail of History. Walking to work, to a restaurant in uptown Charlotte today, it's hard to imagine the 1950s or 60s when it was called downtown, and department stores like Belk, Eford's, and Ivy's were in their prime. It was beautiful inside, and it was just, but there was something there for everybody, even though it was a very upscale, in a way, store. It was a wonderful department store for everybody. It was a lot of personal touches to um, the way that people shopped and the way that they um, were taken care of in department stores back then. Built in 1924, the iconic Ivy's Department Store building rises up five stories at the intersection of North Tryon and West Fifth Street. Today, a mix of residential condos and commercial space filled the five floors, once teeming with customers and merchandise. A shopping destination with an emphasis on customer service. That was when they had a lot more people working. People weren't, a lot more service, more, more, more gift wrapping. I mean, all the little touches that you don't see that much anymore. Business has changed. Ivy's was always a good experience. Like I said, generations of people went there. Ivy's shopping experience was all about being special and also about fashion and looking and being the best you could be. When, when you shop there, it was sort of an experience. It wasn't just go in, get something, turn around, go out. And oftentimes you would have the same salesperson that would wait on you and they knew your name and they knew when you were coming in and they knew what you liked and oftentimes they would have pulled things aside for you. In 1964, Lionel and Nancy Bass tied the knot and for these newlyweds, Christmas shopping at Ivy's was a big deal. When we were first married, of course, you're counting your pennies for all your Christmas gifts. And I remember we waited until the night before Christmas and went to Ivy's, bought all our Christmas presents, saved a bundle of money, came back home, wrapped them, and went to our parents the next day. That's, that's what I think of Ivy's. 
it was the place to shop. This old picture shows a choir singing Christmas carols for holiday shoppers. Kit Ivy Ward, J.B. Ivy's great-granddaughter, remembers the grand holiday window displays. For me, we would go uptown um, at Christmas time and the animated ones that um, were Christmas themed, Christmas oriented as a young child, I mean, it was wondrous. And uh, I mean, we didn't need to travel to New York. We had our own fancy windows right here in Charlotte. Joseph Benjamin Ivey was born on June 8, 1864, about a year before the end of the Civil War. His parents, the Reverend George Ivey and Selina Neal Ivey, lived in Shelby, North Carolina. In his memoir, J.B. Ivey goes into great detail about his childhood, education, and learning the business while working for other merchants. Cousins Kit Ivey Ward and Ivey Jackson Sumrall remember their great-grandfather and how he started his business. For me, I just saw him as this sort of larger-than-life person. He was a very um, religious man and decided to go into the mercantile business. At 17, J.B. Ivey found work in Bellwood, North Carolina, cutting his teeth in the mercantile business. In his 30s, he started looking for a new opportunity and moved to Charlotte, where he opened a small store at 13 West Trade Street, we only can find a, an etching of it, but there is a photograph here of the interior of the store in those days, and it was a very skinny, narrow building. My great-grandfather started the business in 1900. Local parades gave J.B. Ivey the perfect opportunity to promote his name and slogan, It Pays to Trade at Ivey's. And fashion was already at the forefront. This 1903 advertisement gives a glimpse of what women of the era might fancy from Ivy's. After occupying the original location on Trade Street for 14 years, J.B. Ivy and Company built a new store at 13 North Tryon. The much larger building had five floors. Large display cases showing off all sorts of goods filled the main floor. Then there was a floor dedicated to ladies' corsets and a millinery shop which sold ladies' hats. Shoppers could also find china and house furnishings but Ivy's would move again in 1924. And he realized after a few years that it was not big enough for what he wanted to do, so they moved it around the corner to uh, where it is presently at the corner of 5th and Tryon Street. It was like, if you've ever watched Selfridges, on, on PBS, it's very much like that. It was the end of a, an era, those soaring columns, those high ceilings, a very civil place to work. In 1920, J.B. Ivey's son, George Ivey, joined the family business. As he moved up the ranks, he worked directly with longtime Ivey's partner, David Ovens, for whom Ovens Auditorium is named. Up until 1935, Ivey's was just one large department store in downtown Charlotte but George Ivey and Ovens shared a vision to expand. That year, the pair opened the company's second store in Greenville, South Carolina. Two years later, a third store opened in Asheville, North Carolina. And eventually, the company expanded into Florida, opening stores in Orlando and Daytona. J.B. Ivey's grandson, Irvin Jackson, started working for the company at the Greenville, South Carolina store. And Dad was the one who opened the stores and was the corporate nomad in the company. And so every three to four years, we lived somewhere. And finally, they figured out how to open stores without having Dad be there. And he moved to Charlotte as the vice president. And he and George Ivey and John Fielder ran the corporation in my, my lifetime. And John Fielder's role? Well, when David Ovens moved on, they needed someone who did what Dave Ovens did, so they, they hired John Fielder to come in, and he became very much a part of the company, and he and George Ivey and my dad made lots of decisions that propelled the company forward into what it became, so he was one of the most important people in my era. In 1967, George Ivey Jr. took the helm of the family business from his father, George Ivey Sr. 
Under his watch, the company continued its growth into suburbs like here at Eastland Mall and a partnership with the Belk family to build South Park Mall. Eventually, the company grew to 23 stores across the Carolinas and Florida. A man of strong faith, J.B. Ivey's religious convictions influenced how he ran the company. Sundays were a day of spending time with your family and um, time of worship. And so it started with my great-grandfather. Typical of uh, downtown department stores in many places, I'm sure. If you went downtown on a Sunday, not only were all the shore stores closed, and the department stores and Ivy's was closed, but Ivy's uh, draped their windows on the street uh, so that people would not be tempted to sin by window shopping. They never sold cards or dice or any kind of gambling paraphernalia in Ivy's in any department. It was very strict about that. And that philosophy stayed with them. I don't think we ever had playing cards in the store. Of course, we didn't advertise in the newspapers on Sunday, and our employees back then were not even allowed to travel for business on Sundays. So if you had to be in New York for a buying trip on Monday morning, you had to leave on Saturday. That was very important to my great-grandfather and my grandfather, and certainly my father as well, but my dad had to make the tough decision to change and sort of move with the times so that we were open on Sundays and we would advertise on Sundays. Shopping wasn't the only reason to visit the downtown Ivy store. Many went to dine. Here's a menu from the downstairs coffee shop where you could get the Ivy Club for 75 cents with a Coca-Cola for 10 cents more. On the back of the menu, an advertisement for a more upscale dining experience, the Tulip Terrace. Ah, the Tulip Terrace. The Tulip Terrace was where, when you came to shop in downtown, you got to come have lunch at the Tulip Terrace. The Tulip Terrace restaurant was on the fourth floor. Tulips, of course, were very important to Ivy's because of J.B. Ivy's love for flowers. And he, he was known for many things, but his favorite were his flowers, his tulip gardens. So that was why the restaurant was themed. It was the kind of place that your grandmother would, you know, take you when you were going to buy your confirmation dress or your debutante dress or whatever for a special celebration afterwards. The favorite thing that for years at the Tulip Terrace was the ivy leaf plate. And the ivy leaf plate is this ceramic dish that had a leaf of lettuce on top of it with um, a con frozen congealed salad and the finger sandwiches, uh, usually chicken salad. And it was, it was very feminine and very, you know, special. And most people did get the, the ivy leaf plate. They sold many, many of them. Ivy Jackson Sumrall remembers working at the Tulip Terrace. I became um, the first teen assistant for white gloves and party manners at um, Ivy's, and that was done at the Tulip Terrace where young ladies and gentlemen could learn how to use <laughs> all the forks and knives and spoons and all the things at the table and learn how to speak correctly and be genteel. And it was, I was the teen assistant, and it was quite a, an eye-opening experience. <laughs> It was where you could see anybody and everybody from Charlotte, North Carolina that was important. Today, customers line up for lunch at Arthur's, located on the lower level of Belk's at South Park Mall. The restaurant serves up hot sandwiches and crisp salads, all for hungry shoppers or folks looking for good food. Not far away on the same floor, you'll find rows of wines from all over the world at Arthur's Wine Shop. You come in the wine shop, we have something for everybody. It's all about service. We can get you in and out of here quick. Arthur started out as a little wine and cheese shop in downtown Charlotte, which also happened to sell sandwiches, moved into Ivy's in 1973, posing a big dilemma for George Ivy Jr. That was a really uh, big decision that my dad had to make. Not so much the sandwich shop part of it, because there had been a soda shop downstairs, and. Um, there was a kitchen and whatnot, 
the part that was difficult was the wine component. When we advertised back in the olden days, we didn't call um, wine glasses wine glasses. We called them, you know, water goblets or things of that nature. So um, again, my dad had to make a bit of a business decision, and he opened with them the Arthur's um, Sandwich Shop and Wine Store in the Downtown Ivy Store. It was a daring business decision that made the papers, as co-owner Robert Balsley recalls. And they've got a lot of letters from a lot of people when they found out we were moving in. And even George, George Ivy's mother was not wild about it. Nevertheless, it was a big success. Oh, Arthur's was a hot spot. You went in and you ordered your sandwich and stood and waited while they made it for you went to the shelf and got a bottle of wine and they opened it for you. And then when you were done eating, you went to the cash register and told them what you had and paid for it. This is when things were really starting to happen in Charlotte. They were bringing in a lot of people from um, New York, the New York area. The banks were growing at, a, at a, an amazing pace. And if you were single and between 21 and 30, I can't imagine, if not marriages, how many dates started down at the at the uh, at Arthur's because you had to wait in line, you know, and so you'd be able to chat. It was a complete success because we had all the banks. At lunchtime, we had at least a hundred lawyers every day who came down from the uh, from the, all the offices. The reason why we have done so well, it's all service. Uh, we really pride ourselves in taking care of everybody. Uh, if we did, we wouldn't be here now. Ivy's department stores had a long legacy of valuing its employees, a tradition started by its founder, J.B. Ivy. Old pictures show grand company picnics, and longevity pins and watches were given to longtime employees. You always felt like family, you always felt like you mattered, and because of that, they then helped the customers feel special too because they had pride in their job and they had pride in the company. In my 50 years of work experience, that's probably the uh, best place I ever worked. John Waverick moved to Charlotte in 1973 to lead Ivy's Human Resources Department. He remembers early on being summoned to George Ivy Jr.'s office after placing a help wanted ad. He said, uh, John, he said, I was just speaking to my mother and she's been raking me over the coals because we ran an ad on Sunday in the newspaper. And that is something that uh, we have never done before, ever. And he stopped and he looked at me for a long time and boy, I was getting scared. And all of a sudden he started to laugh. And he said, listen, don't worry about it. It's about time we made some changes around here. and." Uh, Maybe you're the one that just kicked off the possibility that we're going to start running some ads on Sunday. And with great relief, he stood up, shook my hand, and I left. On Charlotte Central Avenue. We're in 1510 Antiques. Furniture, lighting, art, and knickknacks filled Tim Smyers' store. He's got a talent for selling, a talent he honed at Ivy's. I was the first half million dollar producer for Ivy's. I had about 25 years total in South Park, about 17 years at Ivy's, when Ivy's was Ivy's. So that was my foundation, my, my passion, and I miss it a lot. <laughs> Debbie Timmerman says working for Ivy's allowed her to see the world, and it started with one phone call. I stopped on the side of the road at a phone booth in Gastonia, North Carolina and someone had given me the name of Malloy Rash, who unbeknownst to me was the president of Ivy's Carolinas. And that call paid off. She started working at Ivy's in 1974. And I was an assistant to a buyer and um, then worked out in the branch stores. Um, I worked at South Park managing on the first floor and then I worked in uh, the brand new Eastland Mall store. It was a good thing to learn every facet of the operation. And it, Ultimately, I was given a buying job. In retail, a buyer selects what's sold in the stores. And for Debbie, the job took her around the world, traveling to places in Europe and Asia. It was thrilling. I learned um, how to buy and sell a product 
hopefully at a great profit, and in another language and in another culture. In 1980, as the retail industry grew more competitive, George Ivey Jr. and the company's board sold Ivey's to Marshall Fields. Then in 1990, the Ivey's chain was sold to Dillard's. When Dillard's bought all of the physical plant Ivy stores, Mr. Dillard Sr., who was a friend of my family's, was nice enough the night before it was announced to call my dad and to let him know that that was happening, and uh, which he didn't have to do. After 90 years, the iconic Ivy sign started coming off the buildings. It was, um, it was sad. It was sad. It was devastating. It was just like, it was just devastating to see that happen. There will never be anything of that ilk here again. I, I just, I just don't see it ever happening here. We save some signs each, each of us, my, my two sisters and my mom and my, my, my dad. We have signs that were on the outsides of the suburban stores. Dillard's gave the Uptown Ivy's building to the city of Charlotte. I loved that, that somebody Next. loved that building enough to preserve it and to make something of that space. George Ivey Jr. died in 2015. He was one of the most elegant, refined gentlemen I've ever known. George Ivey was our mentor. He, uh, if it wasn't for him, everything we have right now would never have happened. He took a big chance on us coming into the, the store. He didn't have to. Um, and after it all turned out, he was really happy about it. While Ivy's department stores may be a thing of the past, the memories remain. If you told somebody you got something from Ivy's, that meant something. I was in an antique store a couple of years ago, you know, antique, and there was a piece of furniture in there, and on the price tag, their description of it was that it came from Ivy's department store. In fact, it was this high boy dresser, a piece of family history for Helen Johnson, one of J.B. Ivy's great granddaughters, that her husband surprised her with that year for Christmas. I miss what was there, but I also am a realist, and I realize we have to move on and grow and become what is important. And uh, yes, I'll, I will always treasure my memories at Ivy's and what I did there and the people I was with. I would say that the sense of family and community that was a part of my family became a part of the Ivy stores and the Ivy's company and the Ivy's corporation. And for that, I, I'm grateful. I can't imagine that there were too many corporations that um, took care of their employees um, on such a personal level and cared as much as Ivy's did for every single one of us. Our legacy for our family store is one of customer service and pride and community and for each employee to have felt special, to have felt a part of something bigger than themselves, and then to have been a valuable member of whatever community our stores were in, to contribute and to give back. And I think that was um, something to be proud of as well. Well, this concludes our look back at Ivy's department stores. We thank you for watching, and be sure to join us next time for a trail of history right here on PBS Charlotte.
a production of PBS Charlotte.